Hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about freezing point depression. So I'm going to start with a rough outline of the experiment so that if you haven't read your procedure yet, you can get an idea of what we're doing. Um, so you're going to be taking two freezing point measurements in this experiment. For the first one, you're going to measure the freezing point of pure cyclohexane. And then in the second one, you're going to dissolve a sample of a solid unknown compound. And then you're going to measure the freezing point of uh, your solution. So uh, let's talk about what that data is going to look like. So this should look a lot like what you saw last week with the IMF lab. You're going to be taking a measurement of temperature versus time. So with your uh, cyclohexane, what we would expect to see in a perfect world with no outside variables is uh, starting at some temperature. In your lab manual, it says it needs to be above 30 degrees C. So some temperature, you're going to have your cooling curve. This is just the cyclohexane getting cold because you're putting it into an ice bath. And then at its freezing point, which you will measure, it should flatten out. And uh, that's because freezing is actually an isothermal process. So um, you're gonna see your cooling curve, and then this is your freezing curve. And then at some point, you might see cooling of the solid. Ideally, you're gonna cut your data off before that starts to happen. So if you start to see a downward trend, you wanna cut it. But this is the idea of what would happen in, an, in a perfect world. Uh, you're going to see a nice sharp turn indicating you know that freezing is starting but in your measurement you're going to see something that follows the same path but then it's going to take a curve notice that it does not actually go through the freezing point uh, for cyclohexane this isn't really a big deal because any one of these points along this line is going to have the same temperature reading and that's going to be the freezing point of your solvent. So it's not really a big deal if you have a curve on your solvent, um, but you will, so it's not a perfect world. So that's what you're gonna see with the cyclohexane. So we've already seen what the data should look like for your pure cyclohexane. Uh, if, when you take your unknown solid and you dissolve it into your cyclohexane, you're now going to have a solution and the freezing point of the solution should be lower than the freezing point of your solvent, thus the title freezing point depression. Uh, so let's look at what the data would look like in an absolutely perfect world. So in a perfect world, we started off somewhere above 30 degrees, like your lab manual says. You're gonna have your cooling curve, and then your freezing curve should slope downward. Now, in this perfect scenario, your freezing point is right there. But again, this is not a perfect situation, so our data is not going to look this clean. Instead, we're going to follow very much along the same line. We're gonna have a curve, and then continue along the same path. So notice our curve does not actually go through the freezing point, and we can't pick a point off of this line because it's not going to be at the same temperature of that freezing point. What we want to know is what temperature did our solution begin to freeze at? And unfortunately for us, that's just not on our data. So we have to get a little creative. You know how to uh, use the curve fitting on a lab quest now. So what you want is to recreate this perfect world scenario using lines of best fit. So you're going to select a linear portion of your data and get a line of best fit, which hopefully aligns with what the perfect world scenario would be. And then you're going to get a line of best fit for your freezing curve. which again should line up with the you know, perfect world situation. Where they intersect is your freezing point. So the next step is to figure out you know, where do they intersect because the LabQuest only lets you put one line of best fit on at a time, so you're not going to be able to just drag the stylus and interpolate and find out what that point is. Instead, you're gonna have uh, two lines of best fit So you have your 
your first equation. And your second equation. If I want to solve for that point, right, this is an xy coordinate that we're looking for. Uh, I'm first going to have to set my two equations equal to each other and solve for x. So then once you've isolated x, you can take that x value, plug it into either one of these, and find out what the value of y would be. That gives you your xy coordinate, and then you can figure out what that freezing point is. Now, we're looking for the freezing point depression overall, and the freezing point depression is going to be the difference between these two freezing points. So freezing point depression, we use the symbol delta t F indicating a change in freezing point. So that's going to be the TF of your solvent because it's a higher number minus the TF of your solution. Okay. So this is where we're at so far with just finding the freezing point. If you've looked at the lab experiment, you know that the ultimate goal is to calculate a molecular weight. Um, before we move on to that, I want to talk about where students often make really, really just catastrophic mistakes with their data. So looking at our data, we see you know, what the ideal lines of best fit would be. Um, this is actually where people make mistakes. You can get really, really just fantastic data on this experiment and then completely botch the analysis and you lose all 30 of your accuracy points. So I'm going to show you what people always mess up on so that you don't do it as well. So with a line of best fit, you want to highlight that linear portion because you want your line of best fit to line up with as much of your data as possible. Um, so here, I'm gonna pick a portion that's high up and away from the curvature. And here, I'm gonna choose a spot that um, occurs after the curvature has ended. And that's going to allow me to get to nice lines. Now, what we often see is students pick <coughs> A region that actually includes the curve. So when you do that, your line of best fit is only fitting what's in between that highlighted section. Notice that this line of best fit that I just drew is supposed to line up with my freezing curve, but it doesn't even touch my freezing curve. It kind of goes through a small portion here and then is way off. Now if I were to use that line, my freezing point would be quite a bit higher, and that's going to really, really mess up your molecular weight data. Um, similarly, we see that happening on this end as well. Um, the other one that students do all the time, and I don't really understand it because you're supposed to come up with two equations, but students will end up deciding to select the whole thing and you get a line that just kind of shows the overall trend. This is useless to you. It doesn't even touch your freezing and cooling curves. Uh, your freezing point, I don't know, you could just pick some random dot out there, I guess, but it would not work. Uh, so those are the two main mistakes that people make. They either highlight the whole thing or they pick an area that's not actually linear and then they have a line of best fit that does not line up with uh, the rest of their curve. So once you've assigned a line of best fit, look at it and ask yourself, does this actually look like what the freezing process for my solution was? And then for your cooling curve, does this line of best fit actually line up with what my cooling process was? And if it's way off for a good majority of the curve, that's probably not your line of best fit. Uh, I almost asked if there were any questions, but Ooh, it's a- Are there any questions? No. <laughs> For this next portion of the calculations, uh, you have to determine the molecular weight of your unknown. So the equation for this is molecular weight is equal to grams of your unknown times the Kf of your solvent over the kilograms of your solvent times your freezing point depression. So 
I'm going to point out um, a couple different features of this equation just so you can understand how even small changes in your data can actually really make a big difference. So imagine that you end up with a freezing point depression of 2 degrees Celsius, but in actuality maybe it was supposed to be 4 degrees Celsius. That means you're dividing by a number that is two times too small and your molecular weight is going to be two times bigger than it should be. That's going to put you way outside the range of what you're actually supposed to have, which is why that curve fitting that we just talked about is really important. If it lines up with your data and you actually calculate that XY value, um, you're going to end up with a very, very close uh, freezing point depression and your molecular weight should be in the right area. The other main mistake that students make is instead of uh, converting their solvent to kilograms, uh, which is actually outlined in the data sheet, it has you measure it in grams and then convert it to kilograms. If you accidentally use grams of solvent, you're going to have a number down here that is 1,000 times bigger than it should be, which means your molecular weight could end up being 1,000 times smaller than it's supposed to be. So those are the two main areas where students really mess up because this is a constant, it's provided to you, and this is just a number that you got off the scale. So usually that goes pretty well for most people. Um, the KF is actually provided uh, at the end of the experiment. What? Oh, cool. The KF is provided at the end of the experimental procedure on page six, and I'm actually gonna write up the value now as well so that you can actually see it. I wanna talk about units as well. So. We are going to calculate the molecular weight of a totally imaginary unknown using hypothetical experimental data that Dr. Weber and I are gonna make up on the spot. So she's gonna call out numbers for us and I'm going to write them down, but we are gonna keep the KF value the same to minimize uh, potential confusion. So how many grams of our unknown did we weigh out, Dr. Weber? 3.124. Okay, great. We measured out 3.124 grams. Now we're going to multiply times our KF, which for cyclohexane is 20 degrees Celsius times kilograms per mole. So it's important that these units are here. I'm gonna show you why in a second. And uh, how many kilograms of solvent did we use, Dr. Weber? 0 0.0725, okay. Is that what you said? Okay, yeah. Close enough. Okay. Um, times our freezing point depression, which was how much? Seven degrees. Seven degrees. Is there a decimal place on that or is it just seven? I think it was 7.4 degrees. 7.4 degrees? Okay. Okay, great. So now we have all of our data up here. Uh, before you move forward, one of the things that you can do to make sure that you set this up correctly is double check your units, which is why I took the time to write them out. So, uh, our units up here are kind of our trickiest ones. We have degrees Celsius in the numerator, and we have it down here in the denominator. So I'm gonna cross those out. And then uh, I have kilograms up here. I have it over here as well. I have moles in the denominator here. I don't see moles anywhere else, so that's not gonna cross out. And I have grams here. That's not, not gonna cross out either. So whatever our answer is, it's gonna have a unit of grams per mole. Is that an acceptable unit for molecular weight? Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you, Dr. Weber. So we know that we've set this up correctly because our units all check out. Um, this is also a really good time before you move forward to make sure that you definitely used the kilogram value um, of your solvent mass. And this seems reasonable. Okay, so Dr. Weber, what is the molecular weight of our hypothetical, totally made up, unknown? 116.5. Okay, so 116.5 grams per mole. Now, I know that this is a totally made up number, but to you guys in lab, it will be kind of like a totally made up number. You don't know anything about this compound. You don't know if this number is correct, but you can make some reasonable um, conclusions, I guess. Um, one of the reasons that I know that this is a reasonable value and I'm going to move forward with it is, um, well, one, because I'm, I have a PhD in chemistry, so I know this is reasonable, but two, 
Uh, I'm going to show you what would happen if you had made, you know, a couple mistakes here. So imagine that we had accidentally used the gram value instead of kilograms. So instead of kilograms, we accidentally used 72.5 grams. That would have given us a value of 0 0.1165 grams per mole. Now, just, you know, being a reasonable human, that's not a reasonable answer because I know that the mass of uh, one atom of hydrogen or one mole of hydrogen would be one gram per mole. So somehow my entire organic compound has a lower molecular weight than a single atom of hydrogen. So that's not reasonable. If I ended up with a number like this, I would probably go double check my math, make sure that I pulled the correct values. So that's one way that you can make a pretty big mistake in this lab. So another way that students make a mistake um, is just at some point in here, they wrote down a wrong number. Maybe their freezing point was just way too small, not reasonable. They didn't find that actual intersection. Um, there's not really a good way of knowing if you did that. But if somehow you end up with a gigantic number here, like 10,000, 20,000, which I've seen students turn in on occasion, um, you might want to rethink that. That's a pretty big molecular weight. That's like a very large, uh, it's a unit of a polymer. Like that's a, that's a pretty big compound. It's probably not soluble in cyclohexane, probably not an ideal uh, substrate for this experiment. So um, look at your number and try and you know, ask yourself if it's reasonable. And I know that you guys all talk to each other. You're all going to have different unknowns, but your, uh, your molecular weights are going to be comparable as far as order and magnitude. So if your neighbor has an unknown value of say 300, I'm just making that up, and you have 30,000, you might wanna rethink it because everybody else in the room hopefully has something more on the magnitude of your neighbors. So if you seem to be the big outlier, you wanna rethink your math. Uh, also, you can always ask your IA if your answer is reasonable. You can't ask them if it's correct. They're not going to be able to give you that information. But you can ask them if it's reasonable, and they will help you try and figure out maybe what went wrong. So, anyway, with this in mind, uh, we hope that you have a great lab. It's really not that difficult. You just have to make sure that you do it right. To have a Scene five, take one. Okay. Um, so for this next portion, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not helping you at all. <laughs> I'm useless. Start. I feel like it just didn't record. No, it recorded. It oh my god, minutes. I was.